from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, along with Shelby Varner. And ahead for you today, K-State's Sarah Lancaster will talk about the adjustments that you crop producers should make in your herbicide spraying during these unusually hot days for mid-June. She'll look at how the high temperatures can adversely impact weed control performance and possibly cause injury to the crop itself. Also today, K-State's Jennifer Borman will talk about the value of genetic testing for cow-calf producers and why thorough data is essential for making that useful in genetic selection. And on this week's horticulture segment further ahead, K-State's Raymond Cloyd addresses several current insect troubles in home landscapes, including, of course, bagworms on evergreens. It's all here on Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening in to the Thursday edition of Agriculture Today. Well, this is no news to anyone who's been outdoors the last several days. It is ultra hot in Kansas for this time of the season, to be sure. And it's causing a lot of issues. And one of those we want to get into in some detail today that you crop producers need to be on top of. Sarah Lancaster is back by with us. She is a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. The actions and behavior of herbicides when applied in warm temperatures to the hot side of it. And Sarah, this is something that maybe producers aren't as acquainted with as they should be. You know, it's something that we talk about a lot, Eric. And this this year, we've kind of got a, a double whammy, uh, so to speak. We've had all that rain earlier in the spring, so we have really good soil moisture. So the weeds have been growing very rapidly and have quickly gotten out of hand in some cases. And now we're trying to control these weeds and hot temperatures that are likely to cause a couple of things to happen. One thing that's likely to happen is lower effectiveness of some of our herbicides. And the other thing that's likely to happen or could potentially happen is greater crop injury in some cases. Let's take those one at a time and give us some biochemistry background or weed physiology background as to why that effectiveness tends to dwindle when temperatures soar. So the plants are trying to protect themselves from the hot weather, right? We want to spend more time in the air conditioning if we can. Um, And the plants are trying to protect themselves to conserve water. And so some of the things that happen to that plant are the metabolism slows down. So just the extent to which those plants are going to be moving the systemic herbicides like glyphosate or dicamba or select... Um, that's going to be slower. So that can lead to reduced control. The other thing that we have to get around is the fact that if plants have been under drought stress, high heat, high temperature for a prolonged period of time, they're going to start developing the thicker cuticle. And so the cuticle is just a layer of waxes that are around the leaves. And those waxes, their job is to keep the water in the plant. So the the harder it is to keep the water in the plant, the more the plant is going to work on um, building those waxes or depositing those waxes on the leaves. And so we're applying herbicides in a water-based solution. Oil and water don't mix, right? Waxes are are very, uh, the fancy word is hydrophobic. Water is hydrophilic. Those two things don't go together. And so that makes it harder to get herbicides into the plant. You say also, Sarah, that the weeds will actually behave physically differently uh, and that may impact your contact level with that herbicide application. That's right, Eric. You know, again, thinking about what plants are trying to do, they're trying to protect themselves from losing water. And so a lot of plants will actually kind of let their leaves droop when it gets really hot or, you know, we see it in corn a lot, right? The rolled leaves. And the name of the game with herbicide applications is to try to get as much herbicide into the weed as possible, right? And so when we're changing those leaf angles or leaf orientations or rolling the leaves, we're going to get less herbicide into the plant just because we have less surface area to come in contact with the herbicide. When we look at that, then, the reduction in efficacy, is it severe? Are we losing considerable impact of those products? It can be, Eric. You know, it... There's some things you can do to make sure that you maintain high efficacy. 
Um, things like increasing your spray volume, so bumping up from, you know, that 10, 12, or hopefully not any lower than that, gallons per acre up to a minimum of 15 can be helpful. And that's really important for things like Liberty that require good spray coverage. So, you know, for products, contact products like Liberty or you know, even Paraquat, we want to make sure we have a minimum of 15 GPA all the time. But we want 20 GPA would be better there. Other things we can do to try to get around this, you know, the cuticle issue can be overcome by adding more adjuvants. So things like surfactants or crop oils can help to get that product through the cuticle and into the plants. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you say, Sarah, you're receiving questions about right now is will applying uh, treatment in these roasting conditions cause problems for the crop itself if this is an over-the-top application, of course. It absolutely can, Eric. So we just talked about needing to increase the crop oil to get more herbicide into the plant. Well, that can also affect the cuticle on the crop plant. And so you're going to see more crop injury potentially from those oils. Also, products to watch out for would be things like Reflex or Cobra, Um, Those PPO inhibiting herbicides, we tend to see crop response there anyway, but when the temperatures are really hot, we can see more crop response than expected. So a lot of times that's not necessarily going to limit yield. Um, It's going to be temporary, particularly in soybeans, right? They'll outgrow that injury, but it is something that high temperatures definitely will increase the, the probability of crop injury. So it likely will be nothing more than cosmetic in the long run? It depends a little bit on the size of the crop, right? So a lot of our soybeans went in late, so they're going to be smaller. They're going to be a little more tender. So, you know, you could set them back um, in terms of their growth rate um, a little bit. And then that will have, obviously, consequences down the road. But that's a question for Ignacio, I think, (laughs) uh, probably to think about how that change in growth rate would would affect yields. Um, But, you know, usually the advice is that they're going to make it. You're not going to kill them. Um, but they are going to be set back. Is this an issue for corn as well with folks that may have planted late and that crop slow to emerge, maybe uh, throwing some herbicide out there? So, you know, again, in that case, it seems like we think more about the surfactant issue, right? You'll be more likely to see things like crop oil burn on your corn situation. There's not a lot of those herbicides that cause that very obvious crop response that we use in corn. It's more uh, soybean soybeans concern. Yeah. Another thing, though, that comes to mind here, once more in how herbicides behave in hot conditions, volatilization, is that affected at all? Absolutely. So the higher the temperatures, the more likely we are to have volatility. So, you know, this is an issue for all products, but it's become something that is kind of a common topic of conversation Um, since we started using things like dicamba and 2,4-D over the top of our soybeans and cotton. And so, you know, we kind of think about 90 degrees as being the threshold there, at which we need to really start watching out for increased volatility. So high temperatures and low relative humidity are things that can, can affect that. Things you can do to counteract that. We're spraying larger droplets with those the 240 and dicamba products anyway, but anything you can do to go ahead and further increase that droplet size. So lower spray pressures create larger droplets. Um, Switching to a nozzle with a larger orifice can help us create larger droplets and help to keep that herbicide from from volatilizing and and basically being lost to the atmosphere. As we cover this, we're not inferring in any way that producers abstain wholly from applying their herbicides as these hot temperatures persist apparently for a few more days yet. They just need to make the appropriate adjustments and be wary of certain things. I think so, Eric. You know, I think in this situation, the important thing is just to be aware of what you might expect so you're not caught off guard if you do see enhanced crop response or knowing that you need to increase your spray volume because you're going to have to overcome kind of tougher conditions. Um, You know, other things that we didn't mention earlier would be things like using the maximum labeled rate of your products, 
So other things to think about, if you have the flexibility, just avoiding spraying in that, you know, afternoon time frame when temperatures are their hottest, you know, my crew is, is doing everything we can to get our stuff sprayed before noon. And I know that's not always possible for folks covering large acreages, but you're going to see less crop response if you can go ahead and get out there before the temperatures reach their maximum. And, you know, really kind of that 90, 85, 90 degree mark is where things start going downhill um, in terms of reduced control or the plants changing how they function. Um, but obviously these 100 degree temperatures, we're going to see see some effects. And uh, keep in mind things that we've discussed before, such as temperature inversions, those potentials are still out there. That's right. So, you know, the, the game that you play is waiting until the inversion is over, right? Which is sometime, usually an hour or maybe more after sunrise, and then trying to get out there before you hit that, you know, century mark on the thermometer and then taking a break until, you know, until things maybe start to cool off. But again, you've got inversions that set up in the evenings too. And I I just want to emphasize, you know, we started talking a lot about inversions when we started talking about dicamba. But if, if you look at the herbicide labels and think about, you know, what we're doing, we shouldn't be spraying any herbicides into an inversion. Right. The consequences of doing so have become more evident um, since we started thinking about um, some of these dicamba formulations. Sarah, thanks, as always, for the heads up. Thanks, Eric. She's a weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Sarah Lancaster. Some of the prime things for you producers to think about as you're looking at a herbicide application for the next few days as our temperatures remain toasty. And to mention also that right on the mark, Sarah is posting an article on this very topic in the latest e-update newsletter out of K-State Agronomy. That'll be out later this afternoon. Look for it at agronomy.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Shelby Varner. Genetic testing is becoming of greater interest and can play a big role in what cattle producers' livestock look like. Keeping good records is a key factor for producers understanding their genetics. Beef geneticist from K-State, Jennifer Borman, joins the Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State with veterinarians Bob Larson, Brian Lubers, and Brad White with livestock economist Dustin Pendle and nutritionist Phil Lancaster on our recent podcast. They share the importance of cattle producers keeping records to optimize potential genetic testing while recognizing that the intermediate optimum for traits might have the best results. How do I decide in broad terms is applying a genetic test to my herd of economic value? Dustin, how would you go through that process? It's a great question, and there are different types of genetic tests, as you pointed out, and I don't know that I understand all of them. So I'm going to actually pose some questions to the the rest of the crew on here to help me better frame or think about this. But, you know, think about, okay, what are the costs? Costs of a test, and again, there's different kinds of tests. There's going to be different kinds of costs. That's only part of the equation. The other part of that equation is the value. You know, what are the benefits of a genetic test? And so I think of things like, you know, who benefits from this? Or where along the supply chain are we talking about? You know, when do these benefits occur? Which maybe that's related to where at the supply chain. Uh, why do the benefits occur? And, and probably most important, what are these benefits? And so I'm going to pose that some of those questions to the rest of the folks on the, the podcast. That way we can try to help find the other half of that equation, the kind of the, the value or the benefits. And you can compare that to the cost. Well, those are great questions and, and ones that we hear all the time as well. And I always circle back to the basics and I say that genetic testing is not a substitute for good record keeping. And, you know, the best way to start making progress in your herd is to start recording data in your herd performance. Once you've recorded the phenotypes, there's a good place to start. And by phenotypes, I mean things like weaning weight, birth weights, especially cow fertility records, things like that. And then the best way to use genomics is to work with, we call them genetic evaluation service providers, so traditionally breed associations. And there are different ones now that work with commercial cattle. But if you can get your data into a system that will do genetic predictions, produce EPDs, the genomics can dovetail into that and give you 
better information to make selection. A genomic test on its own, in my opinion, has fairly limited value. But when it's combined with good record keeping and put into a system that allows you to make genetic predictions, then it can be very valuable. Dustin, to your question about when in the supply chain, I think it depends on what traits the genetic test is, is testing for. And, you know, for example, if you're looking at a genetic test for carcass traits and you're selling your calves at weaning, your value of using that test is not going to be very high. I think it's the first comment, and I think I'm going to quote her, not a substitute for record keeping. We've said that numerous times on various podcasts, not necessarily related to genetic testing, but for other record keeping purposes. But it, but it has some appeal because I could go run a genetic test today and it's not as much work as continually keeping good records year after year, month after month, right? So I've got the appeal that, and don't we all want a shortcut, which is why we look at things that are sold to us, the shortcut to losing weight, getting more exercise, doing any of those things. If I could do it faster and easier, I would do it. And sometimes I think that's where the, whether we're consciously or not, that's where our mind goes. And Brian, I know you were getting ready to say yeah. something as well. Well, actually, you, you mentioned shortcuts in the examples you gave. They all have limitations, right? The shortcut to losing weight is, at least in my hands, it never works. So it, what about the limitations of the genetic test, Dr. Borman? And I'll, I'll just give you, you know, the example I always hear is by using a genetic test to select for a specific trait. So I pick you know, performance as a general trait, right? Are we inadvertently negatively selecting for other traits that could be beneficial, like let's say health. And so, you know, by selecting and genetically selecting for an animal that grows fast or grows big or grows efficiently, are we having some adverse effects on resistance to disease or something like that within my herd? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually two separate questions. And first is sort of the limitations of a genetic test. And that's sort of within the trait itself. If I do a genetic test for wean weight, how much benefit do I get from that? Well, the genetic test does not perfectly describe 100% of the genetics for weaning weight or whatever. And so they certainly help us know something about that trait, but they don't describe all of the genetic variation. And every test is different for every trait, and you can find some of that documentation. Oftentimes you see something like, this test gives you the equivalent of five progeny or something like that. And so it does give you valuable information, but it doesn't give you everything. So there are limitations within a trait even to a genetic test. Now the second point is that you asked about making changes, selecting for a certain trait and maybe negatively impacting something like disease resistance. And we know that absolutely can happen because of what we call genetic correlations, the fact that traits are connected at the genetic level. And if we select for one trait, we may be changing another trait in a way we may or may not intend to do. And if we're not measuring that other trait, we don't know. And so have we selected cattle to be higher performing and therefore they now maybe are not as disease resistant? I don't think we know because we don't have the data. We have to collect data to be able to understand if there is a negative relationship between traits that we care about. And if we have the data and if there is a negative relationship, we actually have tools that we can select around that. We have ways to find cattle that can do both things well, but without the data, we can't do that. I think that's a really interesting concept because one of the things that as we think about selecting for those traits, it's often, and I like that Brian picked disease, because we don't expect that there's one trait that influences disease by itself. But as you start selecting several things, it would be easy to progress down that road. No, and one of the things that, and again, as kind of the old guy on the podcast, I can remember when geneticists were really just coming out with kind of a herd level, total performance records and those types of things. And we were looking at a pretty small number of traits, you know, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, and that was about it. And then over my lifetime, that the number of traits that we were looking at has really expanded. And I see that as a real positive mostly. But it's also interesting in that as I try to select bulls or placement females that meet my needs the best, more information tends to make it less clear who the best animal is. And I love to use the track athlete because I think track as a sport has the most diverse 
type of athletes compared to any other sport. You've got shot putters, you've got sprinters, you've got distance runners, you've got pole vaulters, and I can guarantee you that the best shot putter is not the best sprinter. And so if you kind of put a lot of traits, you end up with kind of the decathlete, the athlete that's pretty good at a lot of things, but they wouldn't be a great sprinter and they wouldn't be a great shot putter. So by adding more traits, are we in some ways avoiding kind of over selection on one trait and yet also maybe never getting that awesome, awesome shot putter. So I, I don't know if I'm asking a question that you can answer, Dr. Borman, but I kind of like that we're adding more traits, but is there a limit to that? And what's the benefit or how do I put that all together? Well, that's a great question. And that circles us back to a, a technology that's not new, but is relatively new to the beef industry. And that's selection index. And that's the, the technology that allows us to optimally combine a lot of traits by their economic value. So to use your track example, um, maybe shot putting is worth $100 a foot and sprinting is worth only a dollar a second or something like that. And we need to account for that when we want to select the best animal. And so what selection index does is it uses the actual economics of the traits, which sometimes is easier said than done, but getting the actual economic value and then looking at those traits across those animals and finding the animals that are best for profitability. Now, they may be profitable because they're high growth or maybe they're profitable because they're good reproduction or whatever it is. It doesn't necessarily matter at the end of the game as long as they're profitable. And so index is the optimal way to do that. Now, the caveat there is that each producer has to be very judicious about selecting the correct in index. And this ties back to Dustin's comment early on. If you're selling your calves at weaning, it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to use an index that puts a lot of emphasis on carcass traits because you're not reaping the benefit of that selection. Now, you know, you could argue some value-based sort of feeder calf pricing sorts of things, perhaps, and we see some of that. But selecting the index that matches what your goals are is really critical to getting the, finding the best animals that work for that particular operation. Absolutely. And I think that's really good feedback as we think about applying genetic tests. I'll encapsulate some of the things that you guys have said. Figure out whether or not it works for your herd, but keep good records. Use the production records to make decisions, and they're part of this genetic process. Whether or not it's economically viable is going to depend on your marketing plan. It's going to depend on when you market. It's going to depend on the traits you market. And then kind of the last topic that you guys talked about, I'm going to steal your phrase here, that intermediate optimum is what we're looking for. And you said that on our previous podcast, and I really like that because you're looking for the decathlete. You just have to decide what are the events in your decathlon for your herd, and then you put those together. That is part of a Cattle Chat podcast posted by the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. You can locate the full version of this podcast along with others with a search of ksubci.org. I'm Shelby Varner, and this is Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you, and next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. The number of farms and ranches paying more in taxes would be dramatically higher if the proposed tax code changes affecting agriculture become reality. This according to a new study out of Texas A&M University's Agricultural and Food Policy Center. Now, there are two bills, the Sensible Taxation and Equity Promotion Act, or the uh, STEP Act, as they call it. That would eliminate the stepped-up basis upon death of the farm or ranch owner. And the for the 99.5% Act, as it's titled, that would decrease the estate tax exemption. The Texas A&M study, conducted by Joe Outlaw, the director of the center, found that larger farm operations in particular would face significant tax challenges. The center maintains a database of 94 farms in 30 states. Under current tax law, only two of the 94 representative farms in that database would be impacted by an event triggered by a generational transfer, according to the study. By contrast, under the STEP Act, 92 of the 94 for representative farms would be impacted, with additional tax liabilities incurred averaging $720,000 per farm. 
And under that 99.5% act, 41 of the 92 farms represented here would be impacted. Additional tax liabilities incurred there, averaging $2.1 million per farm. They went on to say if both the STEP Act and the 99.5% Act were simultaneously implemented, 92 of the 94 representative farms would be impacted, with additional tax liabilities incurred, averaging $1.4 million per farm across all of the 92 representative farms. The study said that as of 2021, $11.7 million per individual and $23 million per couple in assets are exempted from the estate tax currently, effectively protecting most farms from that estate tax. As USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack was set to testify on the USDA's fiscal year 2022 budget this week, the USDA announced aid for producers that it said will be issued over the next 60 days, mostly from the $1.9 trillion COVID aid plan, which was approved back in March, and other aid efforts. The USDA says the latest round of aid will be dispatched over the next 60 days. The funds include $700 million for biofuels producers, support for dairy farmers and processors, including $400 million for the upcoming dairy donation program, along with an additional $580 million in supplemental dairy margin coverage for small and medium farms, also assistance for poultry and livestock producers who were left out of the previous rounds of the pandemic assistance that included contract growers of poultry. Plus, this aid would also help for livestock and poultry producers who were forced to euthanize animals during the pandemic. But some of the efforts outlined in that announcement are for programs that have not yet been finalized or have not yet been completed on the regulatory front. And questions about the meat industry dominated the Senate Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee hearing on Tuesday, at which Secretary Vilsack appeared in person. Uh, the secretary said that USDA will be coming up with a very creative way to expand processing of meat products in this country. Export forecasts for both beef and pork have increased, as well as prices, according to the USDA's latest outlook for meat production, price, and trade. More on that here from the USDA's Rod Bain. The main news from USDA's June meat production and price forecast stems from the price estimates for this year. Our steer price forecast, we raised our 2021 steer price forecast by 75 cents per hundredweight, just reflecting current price strength that we've been seeing in the market. But we raised our hog price forecast even much further by about $3 per hundredweight to $70.18 per hundredweight. And again, that's just reflecting the prices that we're seeing in the market and very strong demand. We anticipate that that will carry into next year. And World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Mark Jekinowski adds hog prices were also increased for next year by 50 cents. Meanwhile, more expected beef and pork exports for 2021 and 2022 were also behind USDA increasing its meat export forecast for both years. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Now on to this week's Kansas soybean update with Greg Akagi. Greg? Ignacio Ciampiti, professor of farming systems in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University, joins us. And Ignacio, as we get started with the growing season for soybeans, how are conditions looking right now? I think that overall we can say that the conditions are quite good. If you look at the progress on planting, we are around 82% based on the last Kansas crop progress and condition report, which is always only just behind by a few points compared to last year and is very close near to average. In terms of conditions, I will say that overall they are looking good. We struggled at the beginning with in eastern part of the state. Some fields that they were planted too early. We have water standing on the fields and potential problems of replanting conditions. So we have few farmers that they were planting uh, late April, early May, that they are in the process of replanting some of those stands. And then next things to start thinking is like some of the farmers that they still need to finish planting. So for those guys that they, they need to do the late planting soybeans, we have a few recommendations on, on that. And okay. what are some of those recommendations? For late planted, we always are thinking about maturity group. Many farmers are asking us, should we change the maturity group? We always uh, suggest that 
unless we are going too late, first week of July or second week of July, we try to maintain the maturity group the same that we use for full season because we want to make sure that those soybeans have enough opportunities to develop notes and specifically pods. On seeding rates, we are always talking about increasing seeding rate. And usually we talk about only around between 10 to 20 percent. Why? Because we are getting into a short growing season. One of the main factors of adding more plants is basically trying to get those plants to produce more bigger, faster canopy and make sure that we close the canopy faster. Raw spacing is a critical factor. For many situations, many farmers they usually tend to work on 30 inch we have data looking at 7 or 15 inches. And most importantly, one of the things that we really care, one top number one priority for farmers is weed control. How we can become better in controlling weeds and making sure that we close the canopy faster so we take care of this big issue that it has been a big issue, uh, probably not one of the number one topics for many of our soybean producers. That is Ignacio Ciampiti, Professor of Farming Systems in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University, as he joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Many thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, it's our weekly horticulture segment and canvassing the insect world for you now once more. We've invited by horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, Raymond Cloyd. He's with us monthly to catch us up on the latest pests that need to be dealt with out there. And we'll be looking largely at the landscape, Raymond. It is very much the midst of the bagworm control season for those landscape evergreens, right? It is very much, Eric. Right now, the bagworms uh, should be out. And this is where people need to be out there looking at their conifers, trees, and shrubs for the presence of those quarter-inch bags at this point and applying treatments. And about this time of year, we recommend uh, two insecticides. One is Bacillus thuringiensis kerastachy, also known as BTK. And the other is spinosad. Now, both of these are very good on those small quarter-inch caterpillars. And they're stomach poisons, so they have to be consumed. But if you make four applications once each week, uh, you'll really do a nice job in reducing populations of bagworms. I can tell you from experience, in my house, every year I do that. Now, you have to keep spraying. You can't do one because they do balloon in or move in on wind from certain areas. And so you need to keep it up for about three to four weeks. Now, you say that bagworms are starting to bag up at this point or nearing that point. What are folks looking for out there? Well, when you see those bags, quarter-inch bags, it's time to get out there with some type of uh, insecticide, like I mentioned, the BTK or spinosad. And, and these are sold under various formulations, generic products out there. And you want to uh, get thorough coverage of all plant parts, primarily the outer canopy, which is where they're going to be at. And again, if you do that once a week for four weeks, it's, it's going to have a substantial impact in managing those populations. These are most frequent on those evergreens out there, but they can turn up on other plant material, can they not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, initially they have been only thought as a conifer through the uh, arbovita, but uh, we've seen them on roses, hackberry, a whole, quite a few different broadly plants. So they're not restricted to the conifers anymore. Crab apple and, and really chicken wire, we've seen them on, <laughs> you know, though they're eating it, but, you know, they do have a wide host range more so than people think. And uh, so this is that window of opportunity to minimize potential damage, both aesthetic damage by taking action during this time of year. If you haven't started with that initial application against bagworms, do so soon. If you've already begun, keep that going for the next few weeks. Four treatments in all should get the job done. And there are mosquitoes as we talk about summertime pests, and they are flourishing right now, Raymond? Yeah, well, we've had a wet May and uh, as part of a June. We've had now warm weather, and so I've seen mosquitoes out when I sit on my, my, my deck. Of course, mosquito management is a threefold process. Uh, number one is remove any stagnant water, anything that collects water like wheelbarrows, uh, dog dishes, tires is a big one. And then, you know, basically uh, putting repellent on if you're outside. DEET is still the major one. Uh, You don't need any more than 30% DEET. 
And then the mosquito dunks, which you can place in ponds uh, where there's fish, and it won't impact the fish, but it'll kill the larval stage of the mosquito and consequently reduce the populations. Yeah. Now, you field this question every summer. Is there something that the homeowner can use to area-wide control mosquitoes in the full yard, for instance? That's a good question, Eric. And, you know, I am not a proponent of these blanket applications. It really disturbs me when, when uh, municipalities and counties do that because really what you're doing is you're disrupting the ecosystem and killing more beneficial insects than your mosquitoes. In fact, studies have shown in California that uh, when you do that, you can actually stimulate pest outbreaks like scale or spider mites as a consequence of doing it, especially when using pyrethroid-based insecticides. So I think the, the habitat management, the larvicides, the dunks, and repellents are, are probably the best way to go and avoid any blanket applications or, like you said, regional applications of these uh, sprays. Well, speaking of biting insects, <laughs> this has been a whale of a year, unfortunately, it seems, Raymond, for ticks out there. Well, we did get a lot of moisture in, in April that resulted in a lot of vegetative growth all over the place, and that's where ticks tend to reside. They hang out. They have their legs acquiescent. There's another term for it, and they just latch onto people. So that's when you're out on these trails. Stay on the trails that are well-managed and don't go wandering around in the unmanaged vegetation because that's where you run the risk of ticks. Now, if you're out, what we recommend is, again, a repellent, probably the same one for mosquitoes, DEET, uh, wear white socks because the first instar nymphs are very hard to see. They're like this, uh, like a pepper, um, the grain of pepper. So if you're outside, come in. If you can, wash them off. And uh, if you find a tick, then uh, remove it. Basically, we recommend taking tweezers uh, right near the, where the head has entered the skin and gently pulling it out. Don't use any Vaseline or uh, lighter fluid or gasoline or anything like that. And then get the tick identified in the event it is one of those ones like that will transmit uh, Rocky Mount spotted fever or Lyme disease, which we do have deer ticks or black-legged ticks in Kansas. So, yeah. And they'll be around for the balance of the summer by all likelihood, right? Well, if we start getting a lot of dry weather, ticks don't like it dry. They like it moist and and high humidity. So that's why mowing your lawn regularly will uh, alleviate problems with ticks because they just don't like that dryness. If we continue to get rain, we probably will continue to have issues with ticks, yeah. And one more biting pest, chiggers. (laughs) <laughs> you noticing, are they any more aggressive as well? Well, we always have chiggers. People complain. The the larva, they don't bore into your skin. They bite you. It's the larval stage, especially around the belt and tight areas. But they're just, they're, they're around all the time, basically. And it's the same thing, repellents, you know, deed or picardian or there's about two others that might be out there commercially available. But, but deed is still around and has been around for know, since the 1950s, whatever, and it's still a good repellent. It's good from the standpoint it gives you a long-lasting repellent activity compared to something like the lemongrass oil and some of those other ones that are out there. Leaving folks with this, your extension horticultural entomology resources are out there for people to tap into. You have your weekly newsletter coming out regularly so people can utilize all of that good information, Raven. Yes. In fact, I just submitted an article on bagworms, and that would, should be out this week. But, yeah, we, we uh, have the newsletter. You can access it online. And then we have a whole slew of extension publications. We've been uh, updating them and some of the new ones on on scale and cucumber beetle, uh, Japanese beetle. And we have one on bagworms, an updated one on bagworms. Yeah. Very well. Check out the entomology.ksu.edu website for that, as well as the horticulture website here on campus. Raymond, always a pleasure. We will talk again quite soon. I look forward to talking to you again next month, Eric. Raymond Cloyd is a horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, providing us this week's horticulture segment. And with that, our time's away once again. Thanks for tuning in. Please rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.